welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Are you ready to get into the word of the Lord tonight? Well, I'll tell you what, I know I sure am. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get down on my knees and go before the Lord in prayer. Would you join me in honoring and reverencing the Lord if you're able to stand and stand as we go before the Lord in prayer? Father God, we come before you today, Lord, and we're just so grateful for the opportunity that we get to come into the house of the Lord. Father, I thank you that we don't have to go to church. Lord, we get to go to church. Lord, we don't come into this place to hear from a man, to hear from a woman. God, we don't come into this place for entertainment. Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And so, Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would minister to us today, Lord. We fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So, Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes to see in our hearts, to be open to the word, our ears to hear, that you would have us to hear today, Father, that the ground, that the seed of the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ would be sown into and our hearts would be good and fertile ground, Lord, that we would bear much fruit in our lives. Lord, we thank you that we would leave this place impacted and prepared to do what you've called us to do in the ministry, in our workplaces, in our families, wherever we might be. God, I thank you that your presence would be, be there with us. And Lord, we also ask that your presence would be amongst the churches all across the Inland Empire, all around the world that are delivering and teaching and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we don't think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but as co-laborers. So Father, we ask that you set your hand upon Emmanuel Baptist, upon Ecclesia Christian, Father, on Inland Christian, upon Abundant Living. Lord, I ask that you set your hand upon Harvest, upon the Grove, Sandals. Lord, all the churches all across the Inland Empire, our fellow rock churches in Temecula and Riverside and in, and in the desert area, Father, I thank you for the work that you're doing all across the world in your body. All members, we are all members of one body, the body of Jesus Christ, all working to serve together in the ministry. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you're being seated, go ahead and grab your Bibles, the word of the Lord. That mighty sword of the Spirit. Praise God. It's alive and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Hey, wait a minute. That's out of Hebrews. We're not teaching on Hebrews on Wednesday nights. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Matthew in the 16th chapter. Matthew in the 16th chapter. Matthew in the 16th chapter. I want to talk to you. Tonight, about a subject. Now, before I tell you about the subject, I can just tell you that Pastor Luke was in turmoil with God about this. I shared with Pastor Jim, I won't give you the nitty-gritty, but I was talking to my wife, and I was praying, and I was saying, God, I so desire on a Wednesday night, oh, on this Wednesday night in October, to come and bring a hallelujah, easy preaching, hooting, hollering, handkerchief, waving message that we just smile all the way through and everybody standing up and running all, you know, whatever it is. Lord, I just want to have a good message. And I was praying and I was looking into the word of the Lord and the Lord just kept taking me back to Matthew. Kept taking me back. And, okay, I'd read it and come back and read it and come back. Finally, the Lord said, this is what you're talking about tonight. Okay, Lord, I'm going to die to myself and teach the word that you've asked me to teach, that you've shown to me in my studies. The title of tonight's message, you'll see, you understand why I said that. The title of tonight's message is, A Look Into Self-Denial. Yes, I heard it. It's not one of those, oh, amen messages. That was an oh my message. You're like, oh man, we, maybe we should have stayed home tonight. But let me tell you something. There's some things that Jesus teaches us. There's some things that Jesus talks to his disciples and to the multitudes even, not just his elect group of 12, that he talks to the, the multitudes about that we have to have an understanding about. And, and there are some difficult verses, and we're going to go to a couple of difficult verses tonight, but I hope to shed some light on what Jesus was saying, upon what Jesus was speaking about to his disciples, upon what Jesus was speaking about to the, to the multitudes as he taught, because we've got to have a mature understanding of the things of God. And, and I, I believe that when we grab into the word of the Lord, and when we don't overlook some of the difficult verses. You know, I, I think it was Pastor Jim this weekend was saying that, he, as he went to a particular verse, he said, don't you just want to rip that page out of the Bible? You know, there's a few verses that we read. Sometimes we kind of look at them and say, huh, just move right on. Don't even think about it because it's just kind of, I don't understand what he was talking about. So today, unavoidable, God set it upon my heart to, to hit some hard verses, some some hard topics, but I tell you what, I want to shed some light. Now, I want to encourage you before you grab the stones to throw at Pastor Luke. 
hear what the word of the Lord has to say tonight. Because I truly believe that when we grab a hold of this, it's not a, it's not a message of condemnation. It's not a message of doom. It's not a message of, of a, a, a downer. I truly believe that when we grab the heart of God and what the heart of God is speaking to us, that it's an uplifting message. That the process of self-denial, although it's uncomfortable to the flesh, although it's hard to the, to, to the man, to, to our nature, it's an uplifting thing because we realize that there's hope, and we're going to talk about that hope tonight. So we're talking about a look into self-denial. I had to turn to Matthew, the 16th chapter. And Matthew, the 16th chapter, is such an amazing, amazing uh, a section of Scripture. As a matter of fact, uh, the 18th verse is what we... Uh, what we the title, I guess you could say the title verse for our church. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We're not going there. <laughs> Praise God. But I'll tell you what, Matthew 16 is a great, great uh, uh, section of scriptures. I love it because anything that involves Peter, I love. Here's why. Because Peter, John describes him as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He's this lovey, you know, oh, you know, Jesus, I'd love to sit on the right hand of uh, uh, you know, when I, when I enter into the kingdom of God. And then there's Peter. And if you've ever studied anything about Peter, you know you got a little chuckle because Peter, you know, Peter was the one that cut off the guard's ear, you know, and, and Peter was the one that walked on water for a step or two and fell. Peter was the one that denied Jesus, you know. And so Peter was an imperfect person. And I, I tell you, the harder I try to be perfect, the more I realize how much I need God. And when I look at Peter, I know that, hey, listen, God didn't give up on Peter. Jesus never gave up on Peter. Peter grew to be the, the leader of the first church. If God didn't give up on Peter, God's not going to give up on me. What an example of life for Peter. And so in Matthew, the first part of Matthew, the 16th chapter, so interesting, Jesus asks Peter, Jesus, Peter, who, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you're the son of God. And that's where Jesus comes and says, you didn't, man didn't tell you this. The spirit of God came and he really just exhorts Peter upon this rock, upon the rock of, of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, giving you that I'm the, I'm the son of God. Upon this, I will build my church. And here's Peter up on his high horse. Hey, look at me, guys. <laughs> right afterwards, Jesus says, hey, there's going to be a time where they're going to take the son of man. They're going to take me and they're going to do some bad things. And Peter pulls Jesus aside privately rebukes him. Jesus, this stuff's not going to happen to you. And Jesus, right after, I'll tell you what, right after exhorting Peter, says the words to Peter, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> this is all in the same chapter. I mean, this guy is up one moment down the next. And after Peter comes and, and tries to rebuke Jesus privately, Jesus goes and he turns to his disciples and he and he begins to tell them, he begins to teach them and say some things to them. And that's what I want to base our scriptures off of tonight. Matthew, the 16th chapter. We're talking about a look, in, look at self-denial. Matthew, the 16th chapter, in the 24th verse, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Matthew 16, verse number 24, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. There's that word, self-denial. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now listen to these words that Jesus says in verse number 25. For whoever deserves, desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it, my page is turned, for what profit is it if a, for a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man Give in exchange for his soul. So he begins to speak and he's talking to his disciples and he's talking and he goes on to talk about the Son of Man returning and, and rewarding those who serve. But he says in verse number 24, what we base off tonight is, if anyone desires to come after him, if anybody desires to follow Jesus, a desire, a heartfelt desire, a, a longing to, I, Jesus, I really truly do want to follow after you, he says, deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. That, that topic of self-denial is a hard topic because we know that there's implications about denying ourselves. There's, there's things that are going to rub us the wrong way. And, and in today's day and age, church, we live a life of convenience. We have the information at our fingertips with our phones. We can't wait in line longer than a few minutes to get something to get our coffee, if we're driving through the drive through the day and age of fast food, where if it's, if it's not, if you don't get it in under two minutes, it's free. We live in a day of convenience. 
And one of the things that I want to talk to you tonight about, and this is why I believe it's hard, but I believe that when we grab a hold of it, it's good and it's uplifting, is that the process of self-denial goes against the very, the, the very thought of convenience. It goes against the very thought of our flesh. It goes against the very, the very makeup of who we are in this day and age. You know, we, we have the information at our fingertips, but now all of a sudden to deny ourselves, to take up that cross, to shed what we once were, to shed our own ambitions, our own desires, our own wants, to shed what our flesh wants, to take up the cross and follow Jesus. You know, one of the things that we do in convenience is we've, in this modern day and age, we've made a convenient gospel. As a young adults pastor of the church, let me tell you a travesty that's going on in your country and in, and in your children and your teenagers and for those of you, your, your college age students, is they're growing up with a gospel that's convenient for them. That you do whatever you want to do and the grace of God covers you, who you are, how you are, that's how you are. We make this convenient gospel, we make this convenient teaching of, okay, well, God accepts me for who I am, for how I am, for how I live. We take certain scriptures and we, we apply them and we take other scriptures and we don't apply them. Well, he wasn't talking about that or he was addressing some other crowd. Whatever it might be. And we've taken, because we live in a convenient society, we've taken the gospel, which is not always easy to digest. Let's be honest. It's not always easy to grab a hold of. And we've turned it into a convenient gospel, easy for everybody to hold and grab a hold of. But the fact of the matter is, is that Jesus says some very real words to his disciples here. He says, if you really want to follow me, if you really, really want to be my disciple, if you really want to be in the family, that you have to deny yourself. You have to put away yourself. You have to take up your cross and follow me. He says, if you look to save your life, you're going to lose it. But he who loses his life for Jesus, he says, will find it, will gain life. Amen. What good does it do a man to profit the world? If he loses his soul, what good does it do if you have all the money in the world? What good does it do if you lived an entire, your entire life of selfish ambition, of, 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 of fulfilling the lusts of your flesh, of fulfilling your own desires? What good does it do if at the end of your life you've got all the money in the world, you've got all the possessions of the world, but you don't have happiness and you don't have hope because you missed out on Jesus Christ? So the fact of the matter is, is that although we want to be convenient, we cannot look at the gospel in a convenient light. We have to look at it for all it is. The good and the bad. The easy and the hard. But let me tell you something. We're going to talk about this a little bit tonight. That word grace, that word grace comes in on our behalf. God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. Let me tell you something. The grace of God allows us to go with the gospel, to live and abide by the gospel of Jesus Christ, to pick up the cross and follow him. The grace of God allows us, helps us to deny ourselves so that we can follow Jesus how he told us to. And that we do not have to rely tonight on our own ability, on our own, on our own power to get this done, on self-denial as far as a means of becoming a better person. So tonight I want to take a look at at self-denial. I want to look at what self-denial is and some of the things that God has shared with me, shared with me today about uh, uh, what self-denial is. Tonight, self-denial is, I want to give you three things. I'm sure we could talk about hundreds of topics, but three things I want to bring to you tonight. Self-denial is, number one, a love for Jesus unlike any other. Self-denial is a love for Jesus, unlike any other. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Luke in the 14th chapter. Luke, the 14th chapter. Now, as you're turning there, let me emphasize that again. The love, the, a self-denial is a love for Jesus, unlike any other. You know, Pastor Dan on Sunday night was talking about love. Use the example, you can love a hot dog and you can love your wife. But we all know that you don't love hot dogs. The same as we love our wives or our husbands or our kids, whatever it might be. There are different facets of love. There are different forms and levels of love. You're not going to lay yourself down for a pizza, even though, even though that might be your favorite food. But if it's your kids, you might willingly sacrifice yourself for the betterment of them. So there's levels to love. Self-denial is the ultimate in the sense that it's a love for Jesus unlike any other. Luke, the 14th chapter. Luke, the 14th chapter, Jesus is speaking now. In Luke, 
or in Matthew, Jesus was speaking to his disciples. But listen here, I want to point this out. Jesus wasn't speaking in Luke, the 14th chapter, to the disciples here. The Bible tells us in Luke, the 14th chapter, in verse number 25, it's not on the overhead, I just want to show this to you in verse number 25, it says that now great multitudes went with him and he turned and said to them. So one might say, well, Jesus was saying that you have to give all if you want to be one of the elected disciples. Now he's speaking to the multitudes. He's speaking to the crowds. And in Luke, the 14th chapter, we're talking about a love of Jesus unlike any, as, any other is self-denial. Listen to what it says in Luke, the 14th chapter, verse number 26. If anyone comes to me, now listen, remember what I said. Before you pick up the rocks to throw at me, let's talk. Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Pastor Luke, that's one of those verses that one time I read that and I just ran right on through it, just kept on going because I was like, huh? Are you saying, Pastor Luke, are we reading that the word says that we have to hate our families? That we have to hate our husbands and our wives and our children? That I have to look at my wife in the morning and I see her as I get up and I have this special feeling for her and I look to Stacy and I said, babe, mm, I just hate you. No, God's not saying that we have to hate our families. He's not saying that we have to hate our children. As a matter of fact, it's the will of God for us as parents to love our children, to raise them. If, as a matter of fact, is a sign of our love, we would raise them in the ways of the Lord. Train up a child in the way he should go and he will not depart from it. So if we want our kids to succeed as a sign of love, we show them the things of God. We love them. But Jesus here is making a point and he's painting a drastic picture to those who are Speaking to him, I have it for you in the New Living Translation. I want to show you, a, a, a shed a little bit of light on this. The New Living Translation is a, perhaps a bit more of a modern translation. It says, if any of you want to be my disciples, you must hate everyone else, listen to this, by comparison. Now do you get what I'm saying? Jesus didn't say, hey, listen, you got to hate your wife. Some of your husbands are like, don't even look. Don't, just, listen, some of you wives, don't even look. No, 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 we're not going there. You may feel like, hey, you say, praise the Lord, I've been wanting somebody to tell me that. That is not what we're talking about. <laughs> but here Jesus is saying, hey, listen, by comparison, we're talking about self-denial. Self-denial is a love for Jesus unlike any other. And Jesus Christ says, hey, listen, when you look at the amount you love Jesus Christ, it should, by comparison, it should make all other love in your life, your husbands, your wife, your children, it should make them look like hate because the love that you have for Jesus is unlike anything else. <laughs> Jesus is telling his disciples, he's telling the multitudes, hey, Listen, you want to be my disciple, you got to sell out for God. You see, God's not after us to hate our families. God's not after us to have issues with them. God wants us to love them. But in terms of scale, in terms of size, the love that we have should, of, for Jesus Christ should be like the size of the sun in comparison to our love for our loved ones as the size of the moon. That when you would hold the moon up to the sun, you wouldn't even be able to see it if you saw the entire sun because it was so small. It'd be but a speck in the picture. And it doesn't mean that we can't love our relatives any less. It doesn't mean that we can't love our children any less or our family members any less, our husbands and wife. But rather, we should love them all the more. But as we grow in love for our family members and love for our children and love for those around us, we also ought to grow in love for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because God desires a love relationship between you and him, unlike anything you've ever imagined, unlike anything you've ever lived, unlike anything you've ever seen. The Bible gives us a, a picture of the church and Jesus Christ, the bridegroom of uh, uh, us being the bride and Jesus being the bridegroom, the, the, the husband to the church. And he paints a picture of a marriage relationship between us and, and Jesus Christ because it's in our life, it's the most intimate, it's the pinnacle of love. 
But God has a desire for you and I to go even more deeper, to be more intimate, to be more in love than you are with a husband, than you are with a wife, that your love for God would be unlike anything, inexplainable to anybody else. It's just deep. It's rich. You see, God loved you so much. I don't think that this is where we have to grab a hold of it. You see, God loved you and I so much that he gave his most prized possession, his son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess on the cross so that we could choose him, that we could in turn live a relationship that is close, that is united through Jesus Christ, that we can live in a love relationship with our Lord and Savior. Jesus, as he returned, I was just reading about this list. Uh, I was uh, reading and, and I was following along with the and teaching I was hearing. Jesus, as he returned to his disciples, bore the scars on his hand, bore the scars on his side. And his disciples, he said, look and see my hand, touch my side. He bears the scars of our salvation as a remembrance of what he did for us as a sign, as a token of his love. You see, God wants us to remember the love that he poured out for us in a, in a way that we live a life of love towards him, that we remember who he is, that we live a life of love sold out for Jesus Christ, a love unlike any. And it's hard because when you have children, when you're married, you know that love is, it, it's hard when you look at your children. How many of you are parents in the place today? Let me see, look at you, all of you. Well, you're not all of you, but praise God, most of you. <laughs> You know that when you look at your children, unconditional love, you just look at them and they didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to say anything. They didn't have to say, Daddy, I love you. Mommy, I love you. You just look at them and just, Ugh. you don't think you can love something anymore. And God looks at us like that all the more to the point he gave his son Jesus for us. And he desires a relationship even deeper than that. You know, God knows us so well. He knows humans. He knows people. He created us after all. He knows that we're people of, of habit. He knows that we're people of, 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 of order. And this, the, the longer things go, the more habitual we get into. You know this. If you've been married for any length of time, you know that you just get into a habit of love. You get into a habit of relationship as, as parents. You learn to deal with things. And, and, and life goes on and day goes on and day goes on. And that's why Jesus comes and he says this, this statement. He emphasizes this to his disciples because he, because, because he knows if he simply just said to you and I, church, love me, that you and I would love him. But we would get into a habitual relationship, a habitual love. Yeah, oh God, I love you, but I don't remember why. I just remember that I love you. But he says, no, you can't just love me. You have to love me unlike anything else to the point where you look at every other form of love. It's not a habitual love. It's not a love that you go by 30 years and you say, yeah, I love him, but I don't know why. I just say, I do. But rather, 30 years from now, after living a life of Jesus Christ, you say, wow, I can't believe how much more today I love him than, because otherwise we get stuck in a ritual. Otherwise, we come to church on one, once a week, twice a week, and we hear the word of God and we say, great, wonderful. But when we live a life that shocks us of our habit, that shocks us out of our habitual love for God and says, listen, there has to be something more. A love beyond all other loves for Jesus Christ. A sellout love for Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden it shakes us from our habitual and reminds us, hey, listen, God paid a price for us. We have got to do something about that in our lives by loving him unlike, we've, unlike how we loved anything else in our lives before. Are you with me today? I know it's tough. It's hard. Listen to what it says in Matthew, the 10th chapter. I'm just going to go and put it up for you for the sake of time. In Matthew, the 10th chapter, verse number 34, Jesus is speaking. He says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. What? I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be those of his own household. For he who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus says, listen, you've got to love me unlike anything you ever loved. Why? Because there might be a time in your days where somebody in your house, somebody who you love more than anybody else might say, it's either God or me because this whole thing that you're walking down, this whole road that you're walking down, I can't go with you and you have to make a decision. And that's why Jesus says, listen, I came to bring a sword. 
because it may come to that point in your life where you have to make a decision between a family member, between somebody you love and Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't mean that you've got to walk out on them. That's not what I'm preaching. But it means that you've got to love God and you've got to choose God. You have got to choose God who chose you. I'm not here to preach doom and despair. I know that this is a tough verse to read. But I'm sure each and every one of you know a family member. It seems like sometimes the greatest opposition doesn't come from the world's persecution. <sighs> I wish sometimes it were that easy. Why? Because it's easy to shut out what other people who you don't know say. Some anonymous voice. But when it's somebody close to you, when it's somebody that you've lived with, somebody that you've loved, that says something against your God or your Jesus, that persecutes you or mocks you or pokes fun at you for your weirdo Christianity. That's when it's hard. And Jesus says, hey, listen, if you love me unlike you love anything else, you'll follow me. You won't waver in persecutions. You won't waver if family members come against you. You won't waver if they don't choose him. You'll follow him. That's what self-denial is, is loving God above all else, loving Jesus more than there's anything else. There's no, there's, it doesn't matter what else there is, but to love Jesus. Amen. How do you love Jesus more? Well, it's like any relationship. You spend time. You spend time in the Word. The Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes from the Word of God. You want to build your faith? You want to build your love? Get into the Word of God. Get into church. That's why we have church. That's why it's important. So that we hear the Word of God, so that we spend time in the presence of God. We spend time in worship. And in praise. How do you want to build your love with Jesus? You spend time with him. You, 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 spend, you spend your thoughts on him. You know, with my wife, there's times when I think about my wife. I just, I'll tell you what, I sure love that girl. And I think about her as I'm driving and she puts a smile on my face. Well, let me tell you something. God wants you to think about him too when you're not just at church. He wants you to think about him when you're driving in the car. He wants you to think about him when you're laying in bed at night. He wants you to think about him while you're getting up in the morning, while you're brushing your teeth. You spend time, that's how you build love in any relationship. It's the same for Jesus Christ. You want to build your love for Jesus Christ? Spend some time with Jesus Christ. I'll tell you what, the more time you spend with Jesus, it's not wasted time. Amen. Psalms, the 63rd chapter, it's not on the overhead. Didn't have a plan for you. It just says, the psalmist says, I meditate on your word. In my night watches, I, when I lay on my bed, I think about you. We read and heard in the Bible that it says that I, I, early in the morning I'll seek you. Late at night I'll seek you. Why? God wants to spend some time with you. And when you spend time with God, let me tell you something. You don't want to be anywhere else. I was just driving a couple days ago. I was, it was a week ago. I was driving. I went fishing up in the mountains. And I was driving home and I was listening to this song. I hadn't heard this song in a long time. And here I am driving down on Highway 38. Here's Pastor Luke in his white Toyota driving down Highway 30, and I am sobbing. I am undone. Undone. I mean, I'm sure somebody's thinking as they're driving past me, like, dude, must, girlfriend must have broke up with him or something. Because here I am just driving, like, just sobbing. I'm telling you guys, sobbing. The presence of God came upon me in that truck. I just began to sing to God, sing this song about God. And the presence of God was there. And here I am just sobbing. As a matter of fact, I pulled over on the side of the road just to stay because I was getting close to home. And I knew that as soon as I got home, my mind would go somewhere else and I didn't want to leave. God wants you to love him unlike anything else. He wants you to spend time with him. He wants you to be there. And that is self-denial. And here you are clapping about denying yourself. I told you it wasn't a message of doom. We're talking about a look at self-denial. Number two, this one's a tough one. That was an easy one. Number two, self-denial is bearing the burden of the cross. Self-denial is bearing the burden of the cross. Let me say it like this. In other words, it's obedience to the commandment of Jesus to follow him. In Matthew, the 10th chapter, in Matthew, the 16th chapter, in Mark, the 8th chapter, in Mark, the 10th chapter, in Luke, the 9th chapter, in Luke, the 14th chapter, we see that Jesus tells somebody to pick up their cross and follow him. Yeah. Self-denial is bearing the burden of the cross, is obedience to what Jesus says, to take the cross, 
and follow him. The burden of the cross. Let me show it to you in the word of God. We're there already in Luke. Luke, the 14th chapter, one verse from where we were, verse number 27. Jesus says, and, whoso, and whoever does not bear his cross, whoever not, does not carry to, to hold the weight, that word bear means to hold on to, who does not bear his cross and come after me, cannot, cannot be my disciple. Jesus says, you and I have got to bear the burden of the cross. In the time of, in the time of Jesus, the cross was not something that we see. We look at the cross and it's a symbol of Jesus. It's a symbol of freedom. It's a symbol of salvation. But let me tell you something. As Jesus is preaching, the cross at his day and age was not the symbol of salvation. It was not the symbol of freedom. It was not the symbol of, of, of hope. It was a sign of death. In the Roman day and age, that's how they would kill murderers. They would, they would crucify thieves, lawbreakers. As you walked into a Roman province or a Roman city, the streets were lined with crosses of dead people or dying people on them to show an example. If you break our laws, this will be you. The cross symbolized death. Death to ourselves. Death to our desires, our selfish ambitions. Death to our flesh. He says, if you can't pick up the cross, if you can't carry the burden of the cross, if you can't carry the burden of death to yourself, you cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You and I have got to carry the cross, the weight of the cross, the symbol of death. But then let me tell you something, it's not a symbol of death and, and, and despise and, 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 and demise. It can be a symbol of hope for us. Jesus paints a picture of our obedience to him, you know, when we carry the cross, he says, when you bear the burden of the cross, it might feel like to your flesh, self-denial, listen to me, self-denial might feel like a slow, painful death, just as a death on the cross would have been. But let me tell you something, there's hope in that. Galatians in the fifth chapter, 24th verse, I'll just go ahead and put it up on the overhead for you. It says, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What does that mean? Does that mean that we have to torture ourselves to crucify our flesh? No! I'm not talking about cutting yourself. I'm not talking about torturing yourself. But to bear the, the cross. Let me show you what Jesus is doing. Jesus, when he states this example of death, is doing something that no one else has ever done. When I, the, the, the term is, the lack, for lack of a better term, no one else has ever done when selling something. Even though Jesus is not selling us anything. He's not selling his gospel. He's presenting it. He does something that nobody else ever does. And that is he is painting a picture of the bad. Knowing full well that the good to come will far outweigh the bad. That's why he tells his disciples that you will face persecution that's why he just said, we just read that he came to set a son from a father, from a daughter to a mother. He tells us about the bad. He tells us about the hardships of being a disciple, knowing full well that the benefits of being a disciple will far outweigh and exceed the bad, the bearing of the cross, the heavy load of the cross. The good will far outweigh that. You see the devil. He sells good in sin. Oh, come on, man, just take this. It'll, it'll make you feel good. You know where I'm going with that, knowing that. The consequences of taking that stuff rot your teeth, rot your brain, destroy your life, take your money, take your family. He sells you the good and hides the bad. Let me give you an example you all know. You've seen the commercials of some new wonder drug that cures this or does that or helps you this. And you've seen those commercials of butterflies flapping or somebody on the golf course driving with a big smile, whatever it might be. And those commercials, you know, they're always long. They're not like your typical 28-second commercial, right? They're a couple minutes. Oh, life is good and all oh, things are good. And, 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 and you've seen them. They, they, they spend two or three minutes painting a picture of how good your life will be if you buy this wonder drug. You know where I'm going with this. And in the last three seconds, some deep voice in a super high pitch. Well, side effects are... 
And sometimes you catch a whiff of, wait, what? Did they just say side effect could be sudden death? I'm taking a, I'm taking a sleeping pill and the side effect could be heart attack or stroke? And they sell you the good. Oh, life will be so much better. You'll sleep so much better. Your heart will work better. Your kidneys will work better. Your liver will work better. Whatever it is. But they don't tell you the bad. They don't tell you what possibly could happen. But here Jesus Christ loves you enough to tell you, listen, this is how it's going to be. And I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to blow smoke in your face and tell you, be my disciple. I'm going to tell you what it's going to be like. It's going to be tough. You're going to have to bear the weight of the cross. You're going to have to bear the weight of dying to yourself, of crucifying the flesh. But the benefits of crucifying the flesh are living a life in Jesus Christ far outweigh and exceed the pain that we go through in order to get through that. And he paints a picture for us. But let me tell you something. There's hope in this message. There's more hope than that. Jesus... Matthew, the 11th chapter, I'll just put it up again on the overhead for time's sake. Jesus says in Matthew, the 11th chapter, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. You've got a burden on you, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You see, Jesus calls us to carry the cross. He calls us to bear the weight of the cross. But one thing you and I must understand is that once we do so, we do not have to rely on our own power to carry that cross. That we put the yoke, we put the burden on Jesus, and he helps us like the picture of Simon. Sam Chan, when he was here in August, painted this picture of Simon. The picture of Simon is Jesus is carrying his cross on the way to Golgotha. And he falls, and here comes Simon. If you've ever seen the, the Passion, you've seen it. Here's Simon carrying the way to the cross, and Jesus next to him, and their arms are interlocked side by side. And Simon is bearing the weight of the cross for Jesus Christ. Now we have Jesus Christ bearing the weight of that heavy cross for us as we carry it in our lives. A symbol of crucifying our flesh, of our old man dying to, to ourselves so that we could be who God has called us to be. So that we could deny ourselves our ambitions, our desires, our own, our own wants, hopes, and dreams and replace them for what God has called us to be. To see us how God has called us to be. Who God has called us to be. Are you with me? We're talking about self-denial. I've got one for you. I know it's a tough message. I know you're thinking, man, I should have gone... To I should have gone somewhere else tonight, but you know, God is good. God is good. Self-denial, last one for tonight. Can we handle one more? Can you handle one more? Self-denial, number three, is letting go of your image. Self-denial is letting go of your image. And listen, your image is, is this. Your image is the world's perception of you. How do you want everybody to see you? How about this? Your image is how do you want to see you? You know you do this. Everybody does this. They get up in the morning. Your hair's all raggedy. Your teeth, your breath stank. <laughs> but you know you go to the mirror. You kind of stand there. You know, you guys. I know. I do it too. You puff your chest out a little bit. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, get the shoulders going. Listen, I know. I, I just realized that was the other day I was looking. I, I had a coat on, a sport coat. I think it was on Saturday. or I was wearing a sport coat. And I went to the mirror, and I kind of had this pose like a model, you know. <laughs> Looking at myself, like my arms in this very unnatural position. And if I stood here, wow, I look pretty good. It's your image of yourself. Well, let me tell you something. The image of yourself goes far beyond what you look at in a mirror. I use a silly example, but you know it goes deeper than that. Letting go of your image. How about this? Letting go of your image of prosperity, money, possessions, cars, businesses, kids, whatever it might be, letting go of your image and putting on God's image. Self-denial is letting go of your image. Look what it says in the Word of God. We're in Luke, the 14th chapter. We'll just continue on there, Luke. Luke, the 14th chapter. Continue on now, verse number 8. Jesus paints another picture. He says, For which of you, in, intending to build a tower, does not sit down and first count the cost to see whether or not he has enough to finish it? 
Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Shows us another example. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down and first consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks, Conditions of peace. Listen to what he says in verse number 33. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Likewise, you've got to count the cost. You've got to look at the image of what you are. But then he says, if you're not willing to let it go, if you're not willing to leave it behind, he says, likewise. He cannot be my disciple. This isn't on the overhead, but I'm just reading. All of a sudden, Jesus makes this random turn, and he says, salt is good. But if salt's lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill. Men throw it out. He who has ears, let him hear. He says, listen, don't be like flavorless salt because you couldn't let go of yourself. Don't be ineffective in your relationship with God because you can't shed your image of yourself. Let it go. And the hardest one of all, I would say, is probably this, is self-denial is to let go of your image. To let go of who you are and be who God wants you to be. Now, am I saying that you can't be successful? No. Am I saying that you can't have a, 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 a successful business, that you can't have money? No. Am I saying that you can't drive a nice car? No. Am I saying that you can't wear nice clothes? No. Am I saying that you can't look in the mirror and pose in awkward positions and admire yourself? No. But what I'm saying is you can't hold on to that stuff. You can't hold on to that. That cannot be what defines you. That's the difference. That's the difference. You cannot let that stuff hold you. As a matter of fact, in Galatians, the fifth chapter, I'm sorry, that's, that's, that's the last. In Philippians, the third chapter. In Philippians, the third chapter, I'll put it up on the overhead because I have it in the New Living Translations because I felt like it was easier to explain to you, to see it. The modern translation, Philippians, the third chapter, Paul the Apostle speaking, he says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Yes. You know what Paul was talking about when he says everything else? Is worthless. We can just go back to that first part for a second. You know, Paul right beforehand was talking about his heritage. He was talking about who he was. He he laid himself out. He says, Hey, listen, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm like the Jew of Jews. As far as zeal, there wasn't anybody who had more zeal than me. As far as as far as, as, as knowledge of the law, I studied under the great teachers. I was the man. And so Paul paints this picture of his image, what he thought he was all puffed up and and had reason to boast amongst people, high and mighty on his horse. But he says, now he goes, and this is the thought that follows right after that, is yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Now we can go to the second part, and he says, for his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it as garbage, so that I could gain Christ. Paul says it doesn't matter where I came from. It doesn't matter the tribe that I was in. It doesn't matter what school I went to. It doesn't matter what people thought of me. It doesn't matter how smart I am. It doesn't matter how good looking I am. It doesn't matter how many kids I have, how much money I have. That's all great and wonderful. And those were attributes that he had, and he used them to his advantage. But he says, I don't hold on to them, and those are not who define me anymore. He says, I count them as garbage. Why? So that my definition would no longer be that, but now my definition would be what? Christ. So I'm not saying, I'm not here teaching to you that you've got to be poor, that you've got to drive a hoopty with all those, 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 you know, busted up car with smoke billowing out the side, or how about this, a big old RV, and you cover that RV with newspaper clippings of articles of Jesus and bumper stickers, and so when you park at Mark and Night, everybody reads all your scriptures, plastered all over. I'm not saying you got to be like that. Be who God made you to be, but don't define yourself through your image. You define yourself through Christ. 
I'm a full believer that God's desire and God's will for his children is to prosper us, to bless us. But let me tell you something. I, I feel like in the past we have so focused on that message of prosperity and that message of blessing that we've lost track of why we're in it to begin with. You see, it's not about the rings on our fingers. It's not about, well, because I serve God, he's going to make me a millionaire. He's going he's to give me a, a wonderful home and a big mansion. It's not about that. If you're in it for the blessings, you're in it for self-preservance, not self-denial. You're in it because you were dying and on your way to hell. You didn't deserve life, yet God loved you enough to send his son, Jesus Christ, to die. That's why we're here. That's our definition. That's our image. And I know it's hard. I know our flesh says, well, psh, forget that. But the bottom line is Jesus says, listen, hey, if you can't shed yourself, you can't be my disciple. We've got to stop identifying ourselves with materialism. I know you're a material girl living in a material world. But our identity is in Christ. Our image is in Christ. <laughs> One last thought on this topic, and we'll conclude with this. Mark, the 10th chapter, verse 21. You know the story before. I'll put it up on the overhead. A rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, what must I do? And, Jesus, and he says, you know, I, I've obeyed the commandments. I've followed the law. I've been, I've been as good as I can be. And listen to what it says after he responds to Jesus. Verse number 21 of Mark, the 10th chapter, Jesus responds to this rich young man. And it says, Jesus looking at him, Jesus perceiving his heart, knowing where he stands. Understand that Jesus looking at him doesn't mean that Jesus looked at him. Jesus looked in him, knew where he stood. And it says, Jesus looking at him, loved him, and said to him, one thing you lack Go your way, sell whatever you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, whoa, 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 listen to this. Take up the cross and follow me. Listen to what it says in verse 22. But he was sad at this word, and he went away sorrowful. Why? For he had great possessions. Jesus looked at him, and he knew that his identity was in his image, he doesn't want to, I don't want you, church, for God to look at you. I don't want it to be that God looks at you and sees your identity in your car, in your house, in your money, in your job, in your businesses. That's great. Go do that. Go be an example in the business field. Go be an example on the freeway with your nice car and your rock bumper sticker. That's fine, but don't let it define you. Don't let it define you. Why? Because... Self-denial is letting go of that image and letting Christ define you. Christ define you as a father, as a mother, as a husband, as a wife, as a businessman, businesswoman, as a student, as a scholar, whatever you might be, as a mother, whatever it might be, let God define you. Don't define yourself. Let's go back in conclusion to Matthew, the 16th chapter where we started. And Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 16, 24, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For, he who des for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my own sake will find it. For what profit is it for a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Church, you and I have got to practice denying ourselves each and every day. I like to think of it like this. Let's go back to a time of simpler things. Let's not let materialism and convenience dictate who we are and how we live, but let, rather let's go back to a time of simpler things. Simple things are, why are we in this? Why did we accept Jesus? Why are we here today? Why am I in church? Why do I read my Bible? Because we didn't deserve it, but he did it anyways, and he gave us salvation through the grace of Jesus Christ. When we go back to the beginning, when we look at the time of simpler things and the simpler precepts, then we can look at these hard ideas of self-denial and understand them fully. 
We have to, number one, we have to strive to love him deeper than ever, more each day, because a love for Jesus is unlike any other. Number two, we've got to carry our cross to imitate Jesus through the obedience to his word, to bear the burden of the cross. And finally, we've got to let go of our image of who we are and see, us, see ourselves as God sees us by letting go of our image. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? <laughs> Praise God. Well, hey, I want to ask you to remain seated for a moment. Church isn't out. You've been in church for an hour and 10 minutes. I want to do something. Please give me a moment more of your attention. Don't get up. Don't walk out. Listen up. I want to ask you a question. If you were to leave this place tonight and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? I want you to answer that question in your heart. You know, the Bible says that a man ought to examine himself from time to time. So why don't we look at some of your answers. Did you know that you can't get into heaven or hell because you want to, because you think you're going to get there, because you desire to get there? Like God looks down upon you and says, wow, he thought he could get in there enough. I think I can, I think I can, that you're going to get your way into heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it find that you can think your way into heaven. Did you know you can't get into heaven because you hope so or because you desire to get there so much that God looks upon you and says, wow, he really wanted to get there bad enough. I'll let him in. Nowhere in the word of God do we find that you get to heaven because you think you're going to get there, because you want to get there, because you desire to get there. Hey, listen to this. Did you know that you can't get to heaven because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, or as a Muslim? Any other type of world religion? You don't get to heaven because of default classification, because you don't fit into one of those religions. That means that you just find yourself into heaven. That, mu that must make you a Christian. Hey, listen. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that. You can't get there. Hey, listen. You can't even get into heaven because you were raised in church, because your parents took you to church as a child, because you attended Sunday school or Sabbath school classes, because you, you were baptized or christened as a baby. Nowhere in the Word of God will you find that you're going to get into heaven because your parents took you to church, because you're here tonight, come on Christmas and on Easter. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that. Hey, did you know you can't get to heaven because you've memorized John 3.16 and a few other verses because you know in your head who Jesus Christ is, if you know about Paul the Apostle or, or Peter? No, when the word of God is to say that, as you know, as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus is. The devil, when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness, quoted scripture. He knows the word. Doesn't mean you get into heaven because you've memorized his memory verse. Hey, listen to this. Did you know that beginning, being a good person doesn't get you into heaven? Where did we come up with that? That if you live a good life, if you're good, if you don't cheat on your taxes, you never robbed 7-Eleven, you do more good in your life than bad, that you're going to get into heaven? You know, some desperate parent probably taught an unruly child that just so they'd be good. But let me tell you something. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you live a good life, you're going to get into heaven. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. There's more to it than that. As a matter of fact, nothing you and I can ever do on the outside would ever make us good enough. Why? Because God's after something more. You see, God's after an all or nothing relationship with him. He's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. Let me show it to you in the word of God. In the John, the third chapter, a man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus. It's in your word. You can read about it in John, the third chapter. A man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus and asks Jesus that very question, what must I do to get into heaven? And if it was about knowledge, if it was about actions, if it was about good deeds, then Jesus would have looked at Nicodemus and patted him on the back and said, man, Nicodemus, you just keep on going. You're a good guy. Man, heaven is on your way. You're on its way. But Jesus looks at Nicodemus and he says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, you've heard that term before. You think that, oh, that means that you're trying to get me into some weirdo, out of control, crazy Christianity. But let me tell you something. God's intent from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible a born again means this, that you've given him all of your heart and you've given him all of your life. You see, Nicodemus, the Bible describes to us, was a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews, like Paul the Apostle. He was educated. He knew the scripture. He, he gave to the poor. He taught in the temple. Nicodemus did all the right things. And if it was based upon his knowledge of Jesus Christ, if it was based upon his knowledge of the word of God, upon his good deeds... That would have been good enough, but it wasn't. Jesus gave him a straightforward answer. 
God's not after your external motions. He's not after you sitting in a service and paying your penance. God's after something more. He wants all of your heart. He wants all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. Let me prove it to you in the Word of God. In the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church, people like you and I, hearing the Word of God, doing good things, and He's speaking to the church, and He says to the church, when I come back, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. We've read some shocking statements. We know that Jesus had a way to shock us and to get our attention. And here's one of those statements. What he's saying is, listen, I better find you in or I better find you out. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will spit you out, reject you. Listen, that translation means to be cast out as worthless, the kingdom of God. So God's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. What does lukewarm mean? Let me define that for you in terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Lukewarm means this, that you're a little bit up, you're a little bit down in your relationship, you're a little bit in and you're a little bit out. Not wholehearted for God, not wholehearted against God, been running from God instead of to God. Listen to, listen to this. You've got too much of God in you to enjoy the things of the world. You've got too much of the world in you to really grab a hold of and enjoy the things of God. You listen to this. You are riding the fence. And Jesus says, if that's you, you find yourself in an uncomfortable position of being rejected out of the kingdom of God. Don't be rejected out of the kingdom today. In a moment, I want to give you the opportunity to give Jesus Christ all of your heart, all of your life. Listen, the bottom line is, is we can't get to God your way. We can't get to God my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. The only way we can get to heaven is God's way. Jesus Christ says this. He says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And listen, no man, no man goes to the Father except through him. So let's not do it any other way but God's way. Jesus Christ also says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. So what are we going to do? In a moment, here's what I'm going to do. Give you the opportunity to Get your heart and your life right with God. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go three. I'm going to smack my hand on my Bible just like that. When I smack my hand on the Bible, all the same time, we'll do it all together. If that's you in this place, you want to give all your heart, you want to give all your life to Jesus Christ in a moment, when, that, when I smack my hand, I want you to be bold, and I want you to get your hand up. What you're doing by raising your hand is you're saying, you know what, Pastor Luke, I want to give Jesus Christ all of my heart, all of my life. You see, Jesus Christ said, I said it already, but he said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. You say, Pastor Luke, Pastor Luke, if I raise my hand, somebody's going to see me. Somebody's going to know. I'm going to be embarrassed. I don't think I can do that. Hey, listen, let me tell you something. I'm not going to embarrass you if you raise your hand. But even if you are embarrassed because somebody saw you, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't raise your hand and couldn't admit to, uh, to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ in a warm, warm and welcome place like the church? Hey, if you miss your opportunity, you know, you find yourself in hell, you'd raise whatever you could to get out of hell. I promise you that. So don't let a moment of embarrassment stop you from your eternal salvation. Today is the day of your salvation. So who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've never given them all your heart, you've never given them all your life today, if that's you in a moment, when I count to three, on the count of three, I, I want you to get your hand up. Who should raise their hand? If, you've, if you're not sure, you think, man, maybe did I do this as a kid? I don't know. Or if you've never made a public profession of your faith, when I count to three in a moment, I want you to get your hand up. And finally, who should, get you, who should raise their hands today? If you've been living lukewarm, you've been doing your own thing instead of God saying, hey, listen, if you've been riding that fence, it's time for you to jump to the right side, to be hot for Jesus. Get your hand up in a moment. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. We'll go from there. So all across this auditorium, all at the same time, if that's you, today is the day of your salvation. Don't leave this place without making sure. Don't leave this place today without taking the opportunity to get to know Jesus Christ with all of your heart, with all of your life. On the count of three all across this auditorium, if that's you, get ready. Hands are getting ready to go up by the Spirit of God. Here we go. On the count of three, one, two, three. Let me see your hands in the house today. One. I see you. Two. Okay. I see. Where are you at? In the family rooms? Is that one, three? All right. 
Let me see your hands. If you got your hands up, let me see it. Four, I got you right there, brother. I got you. Sit. Five. Six, I see you back there. Seven, I see you. Eight, I see you back there. I got you. Eight wise people. Where are you at? Number nine. You say, man, I wonder if I should do this. You need to get your hand up. I see people pointing over in this direction. Nine, ten, I got you guys. I see you. Ten wise people. You're thinking, man, I wonder if I should do this. Eleven, I got you, brother. 11 wise people. Hey, I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. If that's you in this place, you need to get your hand up. Listen, quit playing games with God today. Make sure. Go forward for God. If that's you, get your hand up so I can see it. Put it right back down. I see you. Oh, uh, what is that? 12. 13. Praise God. 14. Praise God. 15. 15 wise people. Where are you at? 16. 17. 18. Where are you at? 16. Spirit of God's moving on the hearts and the lives of the people in this place. Let's just give him a moment. If that's you, I don't want to pass you by. You say, man, I wonder if I should do this. Do this today. You will not regret it. Let's go forward for God. See people pointing over here. 18. What was that, 17? I don't want to lose count. 17. Where are you at, number 18? Where are you at, number 19? Say, man, I wonder if I should do this. You need to do this. Don't let anything distract you today. If that's you, make this decision. Where are you at? Quit playing games with guys saying, man, I wish this guy would shut up. I'm ready to get out of here. Maybe it's time for you to look into yourself. Where are you at? Anybody else in this place today? I don't want to pass you by. I'm going to close this up in a moment. Where are you at? Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on. If that's you, get your hand up today. I don't want to miss you. I know you're in this place. By the Spirit of God, I know you're in this place. Come on. Anybody else? Praise God for 17 wise people. Hallelujah. Well, hey, here's what I want to do. In a moment, we're all going to sing a song. We're going to stand together. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, I need you to be bold. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus to come into your heart and in your life. You said you wanted to give him your heart. You said you wanted to give him all your life. Come on. If that's you, as we stand, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your Bible, a friend. If you need a friend, get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Get in the aisle and come meet me up here. Let us pray with you today. Come on. If that's you, come home. If you didn't raise your hand, it's not too late. You come. Come on. Come from the family room. If that's you from the back, come on. Get out. Get out of your chair. Get in the aisles and come meet me here. You can come, come on, come on, if that's you. Come on, you can come, you can come. Hey guys, today is a new day. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. So here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here? This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is like one of the coolest pastors we have here on staff. He's going to do a couple things with you. Come on now, we'll wait for you. He's going to do three things with you. He's going to pray a prayer with you. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by, by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, to come into your life. So he's going to lead you in a prayer. Number two, he's going to give you some free literature, some things to help you get strong in the ways of the Lord, to get you rooted in the Word of God. And number three, he's going to introduce you to a program that we have here at the church called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You know, when you go to the gym, you see a personal trainer, somebody that helps you build those muscles, get strong, eat those right foods so that you get strong. A spiritual personal trainer is a friend, somebody that will meet with you before service for four weeks, for 15, 20 minutes, teach you the things of God. They'll buy you a cup of coffee, coffee right over there in the Love Rock Cafe, whatever it is. Teach you some things of the Word of God to get you strong in the ways of God so you don't go back to the junk that you came from. And here's one thing I want to say. That's a four-week program, but I want to ask something of you. If you're serious about this, I want to ask a commitment of you. I want to ask you to sit under the Word of God in this house for 12 months, one year, to listen to the Word of God, to be faithful to the Word of God, to, to seek after Him, to listen, to deny yourself like we talked about tonight. And I promise you, 
If you give God 12 months of listening and getting into the Word of God at this church, I promise you'll look back 365 days from today and you'll, you'll be amazed at what God has done in your life. I promise you. You say, Pastor Luke, that's great. That's wonderful. I, I'm going to go back to my church. Let me tell you something. The Word of the Lord spoke to you here. You just gave your heart, you've given your life to Jesus Christ. If you were at your old church tonight and you would have died, you would have gone to hell. Now, I'm not trying to make ourselves better than anybody else. That's not what we're here for. But I'm, what I'm saying is that you need to sit in the, under the Word of God where God speaks to you. And He spoke to you tonight. That's why you're here. So we want to put our application in to be your church, to sit here. Come and get the Word of God here. And I promise your life will never be the same. Would you guys go right over there with Pastor Joel? <laughs>